Welcome aboard on the live stream here with Tom Martin. Uh, my name is Rick Carlson. If you're not familiar uh, with me or with SharpSpring, I'll give you a, just a couple of quick uh, uh, points there. I'm the founder uh, and CEO of SharpSpring, and we are doing this agency acceleration series because we built our entire business around digital marketing agencies. I know many of you are our partners. I want to thank you so much for being a partner. I uh, hope you're enjoying the series so far. Uh, if you're not a partner, needless to say, we'd love to have you on a demo. Come find us, join us. But but this is uh, a series we put together to make uh, agencies uh, healthy by learning from the top experts in the space. We've already um, spoken with uh, Neil Patel. Um, today we've got Tom. It, many of you just came from the lesson. If you're joining us on the live feed and you've not uh, not heard Tom's lesson, you need to register for this series. We've got 14 of the top thought leaders um, in our industry giving their best advice on running a healthy agency. Anything from operations to sales to landing customers to pricing, um, you know, you name it. Uh, it's a fantastic series. It's off to a great start. Um, and you will have access to all the recorded lessons. Um, so if you missed Tom's lesson and you're just here for the Q&A, that's how you hear Tom's, uh, Tom's uh, lesson that he just finished up. And, uh, but for now, I think let's get into it. Let me introduce you to Tom uh, if, if, you're, if you're brand new here. Tom has a, I'm not going to tell you how many decades of, of time. I don't want to, uh, he's been in our industry for a long, long time and uh, as a contributor to Ad Age's uh, Small Agency Diary. He currently runs an agency called Converse Digital that specializes on really the sales and business development aspects, right? Marketing is nothing without sales and vice versa. Tom really specializes in the sales uh, ability, uh, uh, sales abilities and sales processes and so forth. Um, and he works with agencies. Um, so he is uh, somebody that can help your agency if you feel like you need that help. He can help your agency land more business by practicing some of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, uh, Tom's written a book called The Invisible Sale. I have a, I have a copy right here. Here's the book. Um, you will get a signed copy of this, by the way, if you... Uh, Happen to show up for a demo of SharpSpring, so I'll talk to you a little bit about that. But hey, let's get into it. We've got some questions. Tom, I want to start by talking about, you know, really for those people that didn't see the, the, your, uh, the lesson that you just gave, um, I'd like for you to tell us about um, the importance of buyer self-education. Uh, it's something that you covered, and so why don't we start there, uh, sort of for those folks that didn't, and cover the mm -hmm. highlights there for those folks that haven't yet seen your lesson. Sure. Well, I mean, it's a good place to start. It is, so the whole concept of a self-educated, -educa excuse me, buyer is really the premise of the invisible sale, and it's what makes this sale invisible. Uh, you know, this is nothing new. It's been around for over a decade, more so if you look at certain categories, but most certainly in the agency world, and that is... When I got into this business, and, and I'm not afraid to tell you how many decades, 25 years ago, uh, if you wanted information about our agency or you know, if you were trying to buy something from one of our clients, you had to contact us. You know, there was no internet. There was no email. There was, there was none of that. Um, you were limited to uh, where you could get that information. So you had to raise your hand very early in the sales process. We knew you were in the market for what we had to sell and you were identified and then you, know, you were sold to basically. Um, that's all changed. Uh, nowadays, uh, you can, when I was writing the book, I did a lot of research. You can look at any industry and, and on average, about 70 to 75% of buyers will tell you they're absolutely doing their research online before they contact anybody. Um, in um, shortlist type uh, purchases of which, you know, agency reviews uh, fall into that. Most of those buyers are going all the way about halfway down the process of selecting uh, or getting, I should say, all the way to selecting their shortlist. Who's going to get invited to the actual pitch? Who's going to get a copy of that RFP? 50% of them are getting all the way down there. Again, not even talking to anybody. 
not calling an agency, not doing it. They're just, they're just doing their, their, their research online. And so right. they are self-educating, but because they're self-educating, they're invisible. You can't see them. They don't show up. They're not in your database. Your biz dev team doesn't know they exist. And most importantly, you don't even know they're in the market for what it is you sell. So you don't even know you should be selling to them. And that's, I think that's the single biggest change that's occurred that is the most monumental for those of us in the business development side of, of an agency world. Gotcha. Yeah, makes makes a whole lot of sense. Okay, so here's, so look, one of the more interesting things, most interesting things, excuse me, um, uh, about the system that you described um, in Invisible Sale is interacting with prospects when they're not on your website. Tell me how that works. Where and how does it work? Yeah. Well, if you, if you, if you look back the last five or 10 years in, in how people have tried to approach this whole self-educating buyer, uh, invisible sale world, uh, they have preached about Google juice and SEO and, and put a lot of content out on your website and win, win the first page or second page of Google, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they've all been so fearful of allowing that content to, to go anywhere but their website. And the, the thing that, that I think that people miss in that, is that twofold. Number one, uh, nine times out of 10, you're, you're not going to win. Uh, you're going to be, uh, especially if it's in a competitive market space, because you're going to be up against uh, companies or media organizations that they just have so much more content. They have, have so much more resources than you as an agency do, especially if you're a smaller agency, you're really not going to win that. So that's somewhat of a, of a, uh, of a losing battle. But secondly, is that uh, by pushing that content out to what I call propinquity points, the places uh, on the online or in, in offline in some cases, you know, like this, this is a propinquity point for me, right? I can, I can share some free information. I can do a Q and a with you and a whole lot of companies ad agencies who might say, we're not real happy with our business development process. We're not really happy with the results we're getting. Um, this guy seems kind of smart. Maybe he can help us that can turn into a lead. But had I kept all of this on my website, I would dare say most of the agencies on this webinar would have never found it because they don't know who I am. They don't know right. where we are. Bingo. So the idea is to go out and, and really, and you can do this, you can map where your propinquity points are for your clients, uh, where they are naturally congregating in search of information to do their job better, or, or maybe even to make an agency selection. And then you make sure that you, your agency, your content, et cetera, shows up at those points. And what that allows the, the prospective invisible buyer to do, the self-educating person, is they can trip over you, they can find you, they can discover you. They can get an opportunity to say, hmm, that's interesting. That's a unique point of view. There's some value there. And then they can start to pay attention to you. And that is the single biggest, most difficult thing to achieve in today's world is attention. Getting people yeah. to just pay attention and listen to you is so hard. But if you can get it, then what that does is that starts you down the propinquity pathway. That's awareness. And now they can get to know you, eventually like you, and then ultimately hire you. Understood. Hey, so you use propinquity many, many times in your answer, but I don't think we've actually defined it. For those folks that aren't familiar with that term, what is propinquity? Propinquity is a fancy scientific researcher word for proximity in some respects. Uh, it's, there's, uh, it is the number one uh, determinant variable of the formation of future uh, relationships. And this is, this is based on about 100 years of social science research, um, mostly in the sort of marital relationship realm. And what it states is that the closer you are to someone in terms of physical or uh, psychological, and I would now add virtual proximity, the more likely it is that you will form a, some sort of a relationship, romantic relationship, business relationship, et cetera. And so it really is the scientific underpinning of the entire painless prospecting system that, that we've built here at Converse Digital and that we teach other people how to use uh, because it, it's the science that makes the whole thing work. Yeah. It sounds like it's, it's a getting close to your client on a uh, on any, whether physical or, or, or more, you know, in the decision-making process, more conceptually getting close to your client. Is that a rough, rough? Yeah, there's, there's one, there's just one really slight difference there, but it's in a hugely important difference. And it, it is really the difference between propinquity and proximity, which you described as proximity. What propinquity talks about though, is one additional level. It's not enough to just keep bumping into them. Each and every time you bump into them, they need the opportunity to learn something new about you. Right. So the way I explain it's like dating. So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm married. So first time I take my wife out on a date, we have a lovely conversation. 
then I ask her out on a second date. Well, if we have the exact same conversation, we might still have a lovely time. I might ask her out on a third date. But if we keep having that same conversation, we're going to keep having lovely dinners, but we're never going to progress in our relationship towards, you know, something where she says, oh, I think this is the guy I want to marry because she doesn't have enough data points about me that she can then hit that critical mass to move from liking to wanting to, to get married. Same thing happens here as your agency is bumping into people, prospective clients. That client needs the opportunity to continually learn something new about you, your point of view, your capability, your, your thought process, how you think, et cetera, because it's those new data points that ultimately they'll hit a critical mass of things they like about you. And that's what makes right. them want to actually contact you and, and potentially hire you. So that's, that's huge. And you know, that there's lots of ways to do it. You can be, you know, really well structured with your propinquity points. Like when I, when the book came out, there were four, uh, four or five key conferences that I felt uh, potential readers of the book and potential clients of the agency attended. And I, I made it uh, a goal that I was going to speak at every one of those conferences, you know, in the window where the book came out. And we even had the book release in that window. So I was developing propinquity. But the other way you can do it, uh, which I use a lot, is, is email, you know, which um, you know, makes perfect sense for, 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 you know, a sharp spring webinar is, and I even talked about it in my webinar, is how you can use email uh, especially automation type tools, et cetera, to, you know, not just create that proximity, but actually propinquity, because you can start to really educate that person about how you think, how your agency thinks, how it's unique, and that why they should then maybe want to hire you. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It makes a, makes a ton of sense. All right. I'm going to shift gears slightly. Look, I run a, a fairly large, we have about 250 employees now. And so we've got a big sales department. We've got a, you know, pretty decent sized marketing department. And I can tell you firsthand, and I'm sure everybody listening will, will relate to this as well, salespeople are wildly different animals than your, than your marketer. Now, there are people who are good at both, but those are sort of unicorns. And even if they're good at it, their preferences are, are wildly different. Like what makes a salesperson happy is probably not what makes a marketer um, happy at the end of the day. And we have so many marketers principles of agencies, other folks from marketing agencies on with us today. And they maybe started an agency with word of mouth uh, and, and the people close to them and those were their customers. But at the end of the day, agencies can hit a ceiling. They need to learn to sell, right? They've got to be salespeople and they probably hate prospecting. Um, your system in the painless prospecting approach. Can you tell us a little bit about that and really answer the question, how can it be true? How can, how can the painless uh, part of the prospecting be true? Well, it, um, I developed it because I hate prospecting. I, um, I am a, uh, I'm an introvert by nature. Uh, I can, uh, I can, if I know the people in the room, I can, I can light up and, and engage and have a great time. But if you put me in a room uh, full of people I don't know, I'm usually the guy leaning against the wall who seems to be overwhelmed by email, you know, and, and, and is just living down in his phone. Uh, so I feel other agency owners pain. I, I'm not a fan of, of any type of prospecting. It's just it's it's not my ballywick. Um, the way the painless piece works is is, again, you know, it's. As I talked about in the webinar, it's changing your philosophy. Uh, when you think about sales as prospecting, you're thinking like a hunter. Uh, I don't do that. I think like a hunted. I want to be the prey. I want to be the person who's hunted. And and the way it becomes painless is that. And I'll, I'll use an example very recently. One when COVID hit, everybody started doing virtual sales calls. You know, everybody discovered Zoom, and so uh, you know we noticed that 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 was a very topical thing. And and we noticed also people uh, by and large sucked at doing Zoom calls. I mean, it, there were just yeah. all kinds of just just simple technical issues that, man, if you would just do this, this, and this, your, your quality of your, your meeting, the, the quality of how you present yourself uh, would, would, would put you head and shoulders above everybody else. So we just, I, wrote, I spent a couple hours, I wrote a very simple blog post on our blog. We published it. It went out to our blog readers. It went to our social media, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that was probably, I don't know, April. Since that time, I know for a fact, I've had three new business leads come in off of that post. Um, and, and one of them, you know, we responded crickets, you know, I don't know how serious were they, who knows? One of them, uh, had a lovely conversation, uh, just, uh, Monday actually with, um, 
and and had a nice opportunity to start a relationship. But it was very clear, and in, in, in the in the individual admitted it, um, they did not budget properly for the kind of training they wanted. They were wildly off in their expectations of what it would cost to train 250 salespeople in how to do virtual selling. Um, and, and that's fine. You know, okay, no problem. We'll stay in touch. Who knows? Maybe something will happen later on. The third person, same thing. We had a, a little email uh, correspondence. We had a lovely call with her and her top lieutenants. And within uh, two weeks, I had a signed letter of agreement to deliver uh, some virtual training to their team. Um, that was, you know, it was a great little project for us. It was, it was good money, good profit. Everything was great. Completely painless because the lead showed up in my inbox. And I didn't, you know, and, and, and it shows up and they, they're already kind of sure they might want to do business with you. They at least think that you can probably deliver what they need. Now, whether or not they actually book you or hire you or go with someone else, there's all kinds of things that get in the way of that. But you're not out there trying to convince them that you're the one that can do what they need. They've already convinced themselves they're just needing you to get on the phone and they're, it's really more of a confirmation. Call. Yeah, don't screw it up. Yeah, you know, your job's just to confirm, yeah, all those great things you think are true. Definitely right. the person that can help you. And so it really is, I mean, like in 10 years, our, our business, our, our company's been in business 10 years. I have not sent an, uns I haven't sent a clutter buster. I haven't sent unsolicited email. I haven't made a cold call. I haven't even participated in a single RFP or pitch process. All the things I did, in the early part of my biz dev career, when I worked, you know, for other agencies, I've done none of those. And I mean, you know, we're not the hugest agency in the world, but hey, we're here 10 years later and it's been, you know, a lot more fun to do it this way, you know, because I, you know, true story, I actually scheduled a new business pitch around the birth of the, my second child. Um, wow. we, scheduled, we scheduled his birth, I should say, not the pitch. We scheduled his birth to be, we scheduled him to be induced um, in between the semifinals and the finals. Wow. That's yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Um, I appreciate you throwing that out there. I'm sure the audience does as well. And, yeah. And well, it, my it, wife was very ready to be on pregnant. So she was on board with the idea, but nonetheless, it still just goes to show you, uh, the level of pain that you go through to pitch business in our industry. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. And, and all of what you said really boils down into, and I couldn't help but thinking, be thinking about the dating uh, metaphor that you already uh, alluded to. All of this seems to boil down to um, being the hunted rather than the hunter, right? I mean, that paradigm shift, if you had to sort of think of one thing to sum it all up, changing that part of your thinking, it seems like, is what, what your system is all about at, at its core. There's a lot more to it, but that's one of the core tenets. Yeah, it really, that is the core that, you know, I call it getting known for knowledge uh, yeah. because, I, you know, we're advertising people. We, we tend to be relationship oriented people. We, we tend to be communicators at our core. Uh, we may feel very uncomfortable walking up to a perfect stranger or sending an email to a perfect stranger. But if somebody comes up to us, hey, I can talk to anybody. Right. Uh, especially if it's on a topic I think I know something about or I find interesting. Um, and so that's really the, the trigger, I think, that A, makes it painless, and B, makes it something that um, is, is just simply more efficient. I mean, you know, in, in my early days of, of running biz dev, if we were winning 25% of our pitches, my boss was happy as a lark. Right. Uh, if my conversion percentage now was 25%, I'd be poor. Um, and that's what makes this more fun, a little bit more painless. We tend to close you know, 60 to 70% or more of our inbound leads. And if we don't close a lead, it's almost always because of price. So that alone makes it less painful. That alone makes it easier. And, and really it kind of gives you some incentive to keep investing in it because you see this is easier. It's more profitable. Uh, I'm winning more, failing less. And let's face it, every time you pitch a piece of business and you don't win, it's a lot of wasted time and effort by and right. large. You know, and, right. and, and you can't get it back. It's not inventoryable, right? It's just lost, lost opportunity cost. Yeah, yeah, that makes a that makes a ton of sense. It, it just sounds not only effective, but but is a much more enjoyable experience for yeah. for you as as the the person who's got to sell. You know, the agency principal or account uh, AE, et cetera. So 
Fantastic. Listen, uh, I don't need to tell anybody on this uh, on this webinar that we are living in some strange times. And unfortunately, it really appears as though those strange times are going to go through at least, you know, January, February. Knock on wood, we all get a vaccine and things get back to normal in 2021. But we're up for a tough fall, right? Uh, most likely. What advice do you have in the short term, like what can what advice do you have for the agencies listening to uh, close as much business as they can this fall? Well, I, I think a couple of things. One is uh, the same advice you know I've, I've, I've always given is you know to to be a human to to be you know to to not believe that it's your goal to sell, but instead to help that prospective client make the right buying decision, even if it's not your agency. You know, really focus on building a relationship first. Uh, and if that turns into a transaction, great. If it doesn't, you know, maybe it will down the line or a referral. Uh, the second thing I would say, and and, um, and I base this largely on just, just last week, I had the good fortune to, uh, one of our clients invited me to please sit in on a, on a round of, of, of agency presentations for, uh, you know, uh, a service offering that we don't, that we don't offer uh, because they valued this, you know, you used to do this for a living. We kind of value your input. And I got to watch three different agencies make a virtual pitch over, you know, WebEx or whatever they were using. I would, I, the, 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 I think the single best piece of advice I could give you is really get proficient at delivering a persuasive and compelling um, experience via video uh, calls, WebEx, Zoom, whatever you're using. Um, I think that might be the single most important thing you can do is really stop and think about how is this call being received by the prospective client? How do we as an agency look? Do we look like we're a team? Do we look like we're a bunch of individuals? Uh, and that comes down to things like handoffs. That comes down to things like uh, backgrounds, you know, what's behind you. That comes down to things like audio quality, lighting quality, video quality. Uh, that comes down to things like, hey, how do we present our deck? Um, and, and especially as we're handing the, the, you know, the remote control of that deck off, I, I would get really, really good at that. And I would get really, really good at it on a variety of platforms. Don't, you know, if your agency uses Zoom, great. Um, but that's not going to help you if the, cl if the client says, no, well, we use WebEx. Um, really invest in because that was the thing that I saw is some of the agencies, you know, were pretty good at it and some were pretty bad. And what happens is the technology got in the way of the message. Right. So right. I think, you know, you're right. This isn't going anywhere. Um, and who knows? I mean, gosh, everything I'm reading about companies uh, talking about massively rethinking the way they uh, handle employees, you know, do we require people to come to the office five days a week or, you know, is it more a telemarketing is the, or telemarketing, teleworking is the primary and coming to the office is the secondary, you know, type of thing. That's, that's going to massively change um, of, of how this goes forward. I think even beyond January. So as an agency, really, really spend time practice. If you don't know how to do it, find people that can help you do it. That's, that might be, that one thing might be the most powerful thing you can do. We have been talking about that internally at our company, and we built in video conferencing into the SharpSpring app specifically so that agencies could be on a face-to-face -face call with their clients, mm -hmm. um, and their clients could be in a face-to-face -face call with their customers and their prospects, because that face-to-face -face communication is, 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 as you're, I mean, you're preaching here is, is just what it's all about. Right. So. Yeah. And it can be as simple as, you know, I completely remodeled my office, um, uh, when COVID hit, um, you know, I, I flip flopped it so that I, I now sit opposite of a window. I've got a little chair instead of a couch. I've got lighting, I've got cameras, I've got everything to where I can sit just like this. And to my client, it, it, it feels like, oh, wow, you know, he's sitting in a chair. He looks comfortable. I, you know, it, it just feels a little bit better. Um, or even if I'm sitting at my desk chair, you know, doing a quick video call, I can fire it up immediately. I'm going to have good lighting. I'm going to have good audio. Everything's going to work really easy. It does. I don't have to go through a lot of rigmarole. So, you know, some, some as little as simple as that, you know, can really yeah. make a huge difference. As you can see on my side, it's a work in progress. The lighting's not quite right. I'm, I don't have the sound down. 
we're working on it. My marketing team's yelling at me, but we'll we'll get it. We'll get it better. I'm feeling self conscious here, Tom. Uh, <laughs> Go. Uh, all right. I want to get to some questions from our audience. We've got a few of them. Before I do, I want to tell you all about our um, our next speaker, uh, Shama Hyder. Shama is a um, one of the leading experts on on LinkedIn. Um, she has been called the a Zen master of marketing by Entrepreneur Magazine. I want a cool title like that, Zen master of marketing. That's pretty impressive. She's written this book right here, Momentum, uh, and uh, she's a uh, just like Tom, uh, David before him, and Neil. We're bringing you the the very top thought leaders in our space to have interesting conversations like this. You do not want to miss Shama's uh, presentation. Sign up, uh, sign up, sign up, sign up. We've got, we'll show you the link here um, on where you can sign up, sharpspring.com forward slash acceleration. Again, uh, those of you who saw Tom today have already done that, but those of us who, those of you who are just joining for the uh, Q&A, listen to these lessons from these experts. Um, it's, it's gold. Um, all right. Um, back to it. Uh, let's see. I've got a question here from, uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to pronounce this Johan. Um, yeah. If you would describe the differences in best practice when it comes to nurturing and closing medium and small sized companies. Uh, describe the uh, business. I, I think he's asking for the difference between sort of medium and, and SMB, if there yeah. are differences there. So I think the, the primary difference is if the purpose of the question is to say, you know, do you close, you know, a, a company that has fewer employees differently than you nurture and close a company that has, you know, hundreds or thousands of employees? The primary difference is that it's a more complex sale. Uh, you've got more buying influences to, to deal with. Um, and so, whereas if you're talking to a relatively small company, it might be a single person who is really in charge. Maybe you're uh, selling to the marketing director and the marketing director has free reign to pick whatever agency they want. Maybe they got to get the boss of the company, the CEO to sign up or something like that. But it's, it's a relatively simple thing. You got fewer players. Uh, it's easier to understand what those motivations are, what they're making their buying decision on, you know, what are their driver variables. When you have a larger organization, now you have to do a better job of really mapping that organization and mapping the various buyer influences that are that are part of that organization, and most notably the the economic buying influence. And that is the person who can ultimately sign on the dotted line to release the funds. And and that might be a marketing director or a vice president of marketing. Might not. It might be somebody in purchasing. Might be the CFO. Uh, and you've really got to understand that because you've got to make sure that not only are you known for knowledge with that marketing person or that primary contact, you it really is helpful if you're also known to those other people. Uh, because what that does is it makes it a lot easier for that primary contact to recommend you or your agency if you and your agency are known to the people I'm recommending. It's the old, nobody got fired for hiring IBM back in the you know 70s because you know if IBM dropped the ball, it's like, oh, well, you know, what do you expect? I hired IBM. Everybody knows IBM. It, sure. it, it, you know, it gives that primary uh, contact uh, some air cover, some defensibility. And, you know, let's face it, no, nobody wants to make a decision that ends up making them look silly uh, inside their organization. And the decision to hire your agency could absolutely make that person look silly. If for some reason it doesn't work out, y'all don't do what you say you're going to do, whatever, that person gets blamed for making a bad decision. It tarnishes their reputation. And at the end of the day, I think we're all largely self-centered, selfish people. Um, and we worry about that, especially professionally. So that would be the two things. It's just, you know, it's just a much more complex. You got more moving parts, more variables, and you need to be known by more people in order to really be successful. Got it. Uh, makes, a, makes a whole ton of sense. So we got to make an impression on these folks. We got to help them along with their education process. Uh, here's a basic question. How do you find out where your clients or your prospects are hanging out? Uh, well, um, it's both hard and easy. Um, you first need a, uh, unless you want to use a brute force method, which I wouldn't advise, uh, you're going to need to invest in some sort of social listening platform, 
preferably one that can take uh, the URLs that people share and unpack them so that you can then export into a spreadsheet. And for instance, if you exported my feed, you would see all the, the links to all the content that I've shared, let's say over the last six months to a year. Uh, and then you basically are sorting and grouping pivot tables, if you will. And what you fit, will start to find out is that, okay, well, you know, I've got my top 50 prospects and by and large, they tend to share articles from, um, you know, Forbes, Fortune, you know, Ad Age, you know, whatever. Okay. Well, those are your propinquity points because if, if that's where your known customer or prospect lives, chances are you know, birds of a feather flock together. There's probably a lot of other people that look just like those folks that you don't know that are also there. And so that helps you understand not only where they are, but that they tend to ascribe value to that content. And therefore, if you can get your content in there, not only A, can you be seen, but B, you might even get shared, which again, now you've got some social proof because that's basically a lightweight recommendation there. And that's really how it is. It's just, it's simply math. But the key is you have to have a listening platform that can do that unpacking uh, of the URL, not all of them can do it because that that's that's what you need. You need that long URL so that you can do some fancy Excel uh, wonky stuff to make it easy to figure out what are those core URLs that people are 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 sharing. The other way is just pay attention to your industry. You know, I mean, yeah. uh, granted, conferences are, are largely virtual right now, but you ought to know what your major trade shows, your conferences are, uh, things of that nature. And of, of course, it makes sense to try to find a way to show up at those especially if you can show up in a way that is knowledge-based, a speaker, for instance, versus a trade show booth. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. For those, uh, I, I think I may be pointing out the obvious, but everything that you're saying applies not only to an agency landing their own business, but uh, an agency can counsel their customers to do this, right? Um, Absolutely. Social media is a way to figure out with social uh, listening feeds, by the way, a feature of SharpSpring, um, if you're not using it, agency partners, um, where you can sit there and listen and understand exactly where your customers' prospects, in this case, are are hanging out, you know? So that's, uh, that's fantastic. All right, I think uh, that was from uh, Feel So Alive. Thank you for the question. I've got another one from, I'm gonna say a, a reef, Khan, forgive me if I've messed up the pronunciation of your name, but you've asked a great question, so I wanted to take a shot. How do you handle it when your pitch is perceived differently by a different by different decision makers, and they've got different opinions? Um, so, uh, how do you handle your pitch to a set of decision makers with differing opinions? Is the question. Um, I think this is, you know, you've got some people on board. And some people not, or they uh, their team isn't unified about what to do and in what direction. I think that's something we've we've all encountered through the sales process. So, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I would agree. First, yes, if you're you're pitching to a group of people, you're seldom going to have everybody in lockstep on you know exactly what the the core criteria are. Though, I, I do think that that companies do try to do that, you know, through yeah. sheets, et cetera. I think there it's all about preparation. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't talk terribly much about this sell greatly methodology. Um, I kind of maybe just briefly touched on it, but the preparation mode is really where you have to, um, you know, spend the time up front to really understand each of those buying influencers and, 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 and you know, what is their primary uh, relationship driver? What do they really, really care about? Uh, yeah. And then you need to be able to make sure that, you know, when, when, when we're saying pitch here, I assume we're talking about a formal pitch type document. Uh, and if we are, then you have to make sure that in that pitch, you're touching all those buttons, right? You're pushing everybody's buttons at some point during the, the, the document or the presentation. If you're talking pitch in a more general nurturing, um, a little bit easier. Uh, you've got to make sure that if you're having a conversation or sharing uh, information or nurturing, that you're really trying to make sure you're hitting each person's unique point of view uh, or need. But the key, I think, is to do it in a way that doesn't feel pandering, uh, that is authentic, because I think I think clients can see through the BS like a mile away. Yep. Um, and and you know is truly honest and real. And I would say the other thing is if if there is a place where you know you're going to fall down. 
like, you know, somebody, you know, cares, uh, the, the CFO is a total, you know, uh, bean counter and, and just wants the cheapest solution. Uh, there's something called, you know, uh, the preemptive um, objection. And you'll want to build into your presentation some information, some, some verbiage, whatever, that you know that person's thinking, you know, I just want the cheapest. So you're going to have to make sure that your presentation positions your agency, maybe not as the cheapest, but as the best value, which might mean you need to, you know, educate a little bit, might mean you need to change how you present your pricing, things of this nature, so that you are preempting that person's obje objection um, without necessarily without necessarily saying, oh yeah, we do that or we are the cheapest, but you're just, you're just trying to help them understand that I hear you, but, but let me offer you an opportunity to think about your, your objection a little broader because you might change your mind and realize maybe that's not such as a, that, that shouldn't be your important objection. There are other things that are more valuable that you should be focusing on. Right. Makes sense. You mentioned um, at the beginning of that answer, you were talking about being prepared and doing your homework. I thought about um, personas and if you know you're going into a pitch and you know you're dealing with a CFO and maybe somebody from IT and regular marketing folks or salespeople and you're talking to different people with different needs and objectives, preparing for that to, to build on your answer by going through the exercise of thinking about those personas formally or informally, whatever your process is, so that you can have those answers ready and maybe do a preemptive uh, you know, uh, overcoming of objections and things, as you described, seems like a, a valuable tool. Yeah, so. we actually encourage people to go even one step further. We call it social reconnaissance in that you really, you know, the, the, the most powerful thing about social media and digital today is is there's just so much information out there on people, even if you're not sure. a really heavy user. Uh, that, you know, go in and really uh, um, scoop all that up uh, right. because that helps you go even beyond just basic persona it helps you go to like what might be their un unique point of view, their unique pain point. You know what's going to work. What do they care about? What do they like? But more importantly, to the point of of people who maybe are uncomfortable with the initial conversation or the prospecting piece of this, uh, it gives you uh, things that are you know conversational catalysts, things you can talk about that aren't hey my agency, what we can do for you. Yeah, that actually, you know, build a conversation that starts to lay the groundwork for a relationship. And so, um, I man, if you're not doing that kind of stuff before you pitch uh, or before you start to try to prospect a client, I think you're doing yourself a huge disservice and you're probably setting up your tables to fail. Yeah, lots of marketing automation platforms, including SharpSpring, include social media links for mm -hmm. prospects. We append data so that you can click in, find out whether you're talking to a you know, a, 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 a Cubs fan or a, you know, Yankee fan as an example on the, on a personal yeah. level. Right. So right. Um, good stuff. Hey, there are a bunch of questions and we are getting to the top of the hour. I'm going to give you two questions. Pick your favorite, <laughs> play a little game here first. Great. Make me the bad guy. Thank yeah, you. exactly. That. Right. Uh, all right. Do you agree that emotional connection with your customer is pretty important in building relationships? That's one question. OK, the other one is, can you describe uh, or talk further about outposts and embassies? So if you want to answer both of those, you can. I'm sure people stay on. I don't have anywhere to go if you want to grab one of them. But we are coming to the top of the hour and a lot of people may have to drop off for a meeting. Or well, something. I, I will answer both of them only because one of them is so easy. Uh, All right, do I believe in emotional connections are important. Yes. Full stop. Yeah, we, think that's the game changer. That's the, you make an emotional connection, uh, you win most of the time. Yeah. In terms of outposts and embassies, uh, the main difference is an embassy is going to be a place where you're going to show up repeatedly, uh, participate in a community, be helpful. Uh, largely that tends to be social media, you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, um, private groups, um, chat rooms, uh, but it can also be places like the the local PTA, if you're an agency that you know has you know local business as well. It can be um, a marketing association, ad club, any place where you can continually show up, uh, build relationships, and be helpful. Outposts, on the other hand, are are, are sort of I, I describe it as more like a like a hotel, and that's really more. Hey, this is a website, or this is a conference where I can go speak, or this is a place where I can put content and get it in front of, of really uh, high value targets. Uh, so you're going to check in, 
by posting that content, giving that talk, whatever the case may be, uh, you're going to be a really good citizen while you're there. If you post a piece of content on somebody's website and somebody asks a question, comment, or they share it on social media, you know, you're going to follow up, you're going to thank them and so forth. Uh, and then you're going to check out because you got another hotel to check into the next day because you got another piece of content going live someplace else. Uh, so that's really the two and they work in tandem. Um, right. You know, one's really about building broad term awareness and one's more about um, building, you know, deep, solid relationships. Both will be effective and, and necessary in in creating a truly painless uh, system for you uh, in generating and throwing off leads. Fantastic. Great, great one to end it on. I can't thank you enough. Everybody, first things first, Tom's book, The Invisible Sale. If you sign up for a demo, you get a fancy signed copy. I've got one right here. Very. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I want to uh, get your copy. Um, I want to encourage you guys to do that. Um, second, show up on the, on the 16th where um, we've got Shama Hyder joining us. Sign up um, at sharpspring.com forward slash acceleration. Sign up for the, uh, for the whole series. We've got unbelievable speakers that we've already spoken to like Tom and more to come. Uh, just just uh, more than a dozen fantastic thought leaders and luminaries in our industry. Tom, thank you so much. Thank you so much for spending the time with us for the lesson that you gave earlier and for the Q&A today. It's been uh, absolutely fantastic. I know the audience, I can see the uh, comments in here. Everybody really loved it and uh, we're all just super appreciative. So uh, thanks a bunch. Thanks for having me. It was, it was a great way to spend some time today. I appreciate it. All right. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone.